All right, 99.9 Punk World Radio. You already know what time it is. And right here, right now, we are joined by Juno Award-winning, Grammy-nominated bass player. That's right. He is the bass player of the iconic Sum 41 and the Operation MD. That's right. We got Cone McCaslin right here live on the air. And, of course, YouTube as well. How are you doing this evening? I'm good. I'm good. How are you doing? Oh, man, I'm doing great. Just uh, getting ready to getting ready. Hope so happy that tomorrow is actually Friday, man. I'm not going to lie. 2023 has been great so far, but I'm just looking forward to the weekend. See, that's funny. You, you like Friday and I like Monday because I got I got young kids. Friday means they're home on the weekend. I got to I got to deal with a bunch of uh, fighting and like being a referee. Monday they go to school. So, yeah, yeah it's different for me now. Hey, I got to say, I don't blame you, though, at the end of the day, man. You know what I mean? You can never go wrong with Monday in your case, that is. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. But also, I know you're a very busy guy, Cone, so I'm going to dive like right into this interview first and foremost. But I got to take you back to the beginning of your amazing career this far. And I got to take you back to the summer of 1994. And I actually read that at the age of 14, you actually joined the grunge band uh, Second Option, where you guys actually started out by like playing Nirvana songs. I was wondering if you can actually tell our viewers a story behind your humbling beginnings. And of course, like, how did your, you guys and Second Option actually come together as one? Uh, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was actually a second opinion, actually, but it's okay. I'll... <laughs> My apologies on that. Uh, Wikipedia probably lied to you. Um, no, it's, uh, yeah, it was just, it was basically like I lived in a court with, and I had a bunch of friends, um, and two of them got, uh, some guitars and they, they started fooling around with, obviously like at, at the time it was 1994. So we were 14 and Nirvana was such a big thing. And we were really into the grunge thing at the time, you know, Sonic Youth and Dinosaur Jr. Um, pretty much anything that, uh, Geffen Records was releasing and Sub Pop was releasing, um, we were kind of into and uh they they were like you know starting to write their own songs and and my other friend down the street he was he was kind of a drummer in um you know like the school band and stuff like that so he he had got this drum kit and actually his name's matt and he went on to um uh be the the first drummer in avril's band he he toured with avril for the first two records his name is matt um so then you know i was like kind of like this jealous 14 year old kid and i was kind of like you know i want to be in the band and uh, they're like, well, I guess uh, I guess we don't have a bass player. So, I mean, if you can get a bass, then you can kind of be in the band. And I was like, what the fuck is a bass? And because, uh, you know, there was I was 14 and I didn't really know anything about music, really, other than what I liked. And, uh, you know, there was no Internet at the time. I couldn't just Google bass guitar. So I went and bought a bunch of magazines and researched uh, you know, bass guitar. <laughs> I was like, oh, four strings. Perfect. Um, so then, you know, I really like hounded my mom to take me to the local music store. And so we went up there and I, and, you know, I picked a bass and it was the cheapest one there. It was a black bass. I, I wanted it to look like Chris's from Nirvana's and it was just flat black as a really terrible bass. Um, but I think she bought it for my birthday or something. And uh, then we started, yeah, then we started just playing you know, we started writing our own songs, but we were like heavily covering Nirvana songs too, because at that time, you know, we were big fans of Guns N' Roses and Metallica and all that kind of stuff, but it just seemed like too hard to do when we were starting out. Nirvana was that band that you could, you know, learn like the three chords or the four chords and actually pull it off. So like, you know, you get together, like, I cannot believe I'm playing a Nirvana song right now. Um, you know, just learning the bass. So that's kind of how we started. And, and that, that band kind of went to like, basically 1998, 1999. And that's kind of when, you know, we guys in Sum 41, um, we all went to the same high school together and that's when they needed a bass player. And that's in late 98 is kind of when they asked me to fill in um, when their bass player left and they asked me to fill in. And then I filled in and joined Sum 41 after that. And then we got signed in late 99. And I got to say as well, especially going back to when you actually said what what the F is a bass and whatnot, man, like it's crazy to kind of for you, it must be crazy to go back and look up at those days and realize what you what you're doing now. You know what I mean? Like nominated at the nominated at the Grammys, Juno Award winning, like millions of different cities and tours. I mean, like you went on from not knowing what a bass was to actually being one of the biggest bass players to ever grace rock music. Oh, oh, thank you. But uh, well, yeah, I mean, it, it's it, those, it, you know, when we were getting nominated for those Genos and um, in the early days, we, we actually like as musicians, we weren't that accomplished then. You know, we weren't like 
skillful musicians at that point. You know, maybe Dave was probably the most skilled musician at that point. Um, you know, being 21, 22 years old, we were kind of still learning, but I guess, you know, we were a good live band and we made some good records and made some good songs, obviously, that I still love to this day. But we were young, like we were young musicians. And uh, so, you know, to be nominated for a Juno or, you know, later a Grammy, you know, when we got nominated for a Grammy, we were a lot better band. You know, it was 2011 or 12 at that point. So we were a lot better. We were a lot better musicians. The, the Junos were like, you know, that was just shocking to us because we were 21 year olds that really felt like we still had a lot to learn. <laughs> you know, we were green still. Um, you know, it just so happened we had Fat Lip and In Too Deep at that point. <laughs> And speaking of like all killer, no filler, I, I got to say, obviously, one of your guys' most biggest records, that's a record that really put some 41 on the map. And I know you probably got asked this so much, but as a fellow fan, I have to ask if you can break down that iconic record. And of course, did you when you guys put that record together and when it was when it was just starting to hit them shelves, did you guys have any idea how big of a record you guys actually had on your hands at that time? No, definitely not. Um, we uh, when we got signed in 1999 um we put a half hour power in 2000 and then we started like you know coming up derek was coming up with stuff for the next record and we were really touring heavily through 2000 just on half hour power just trying to build a following in the united states and canada and um so when when derek had a bunch of like kind of half songs we were still living in ajax we we're still living living with our parents and uh, there was this uh this club in ajax called the chameleon cafe and they had this like side part to the to the club that was like just a warehouse. And so we asked the owner Pete if we could rent it out for a while and start working on demos for All Killer No Filler. And so we were in there basically every day. And then we had hired Jerry Finn as the producer. And so he came up uh, to Toronto and we went to Metalworks and we recorded for a while. And uh, no, I, you know, when, when we first had Jerry Finn come up, we didn't even have Fat Lip or In Too Deep at the time. So I remember like going to like pre-production with Jerry and him reporting back to like our manager and um, and our record label saying like, I don't think I hear a single here. Like, I don't know what the first single is going to be. And I think the strongest song at the point at, at that point was Rhythms. And because uh, we, we had not had we didn't have Fat Lip. We didn't have In Too Deep. And so we recorded the whole album and and In Too Deep and Fat Lip got recorded later, like in L.A. Um, you know, Derek had this idea to do uh, like a, you know, a Beastie Boys style song with um, like a punk rock chorus, which became Fat Lip. And I remember him showing me um, a demo of it in the car and he's like, this is my, my thought and this is my idea. And I was like, okay, let's do it. You know, at the time it, it seemed like a crazy idea because you know, it had never been done before. Um, this like hip hop punk rock mashup. Um, so, you know, we recorded that, then we recorded In Too Deep. Um, we recorded In Too Deep as two versions and the version that you, that's on the record is actually kind of the more popular version. The one that the other version we recorded actually starts out kind of heavy. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when, when the whole thing was said and done, uh, I don't think that any of us thought that we were sitting on like a record that was going to sell millions and and turn us into what we turned into. I think we were very proud of it because, like I said, we were 20 years old. I think we did the best we could. Um, for what age we were and what we had done up until that point, because we really hadn't done much. Uh, we were fresh out of high school. Uh, so I think we were proud of it mostly. And, and yeah, didn't think that, you know, we didn't know. We just thought, okay, this is a record that we are proud of. We'll put it out and the label can do what they do. And when you talked about like the hip hop mashup with Fat Lip, I also noticed as well that your I, I believe it was your guys' very first mainstream music video makes no difference. You guys actually had DMX ride through the house party actually on on an ATV. I gotta ask, man, like how did you guys actually get connected with DMX? Did you guys bump into him at like a festival or something, or like, or did you just call up DMX like, yo, we need you in the video? No, it was uh, it was kind of luck. Uh, DMX was like we were on Island Def Jam, the record label, and so was he. And so he just so happened, we were doing that video in, in Mississauga and uh, he just so happened he was filming a movie in Toronto at the same time. And, you know, our, our president of our label, Lior Cohen, you know, he's tied, tied into all these people. Like he was, Lior Cohen was the, um, the tour manager for the Beastie Boys, you know, so he, you know, he knew all these hip hop guys. And uh, so he, he just told DMX, I think really paid DMX <laughs> to come <laughs> into our video. And I remember DMX, he was, he was cool to us. Like he was, you know, a very, um, like 
he seemed like very serious, but you know, he was very friendly. Um, and you know, I remember taking a, we took a photo with him and he told us we couldn't smile like that. You know, it was like this, the hip hop thing is like, you gotta be serious. And, uh, I remember that, that four wheeler he drove into in that video. Um, he wanted to keep that too. <laughs> He's like, I'll come to the video. You got to pay me this amount of money, and I want the four wheeler. <laughs> so he he literally yeah. drove off into the sunset with the with the ATV as well, and a joint in his mouth. <laughs> and that definitely sounds like DMX. But at the end of the day, that's a phenomenal cameo to have in anybody's a very first mainstream music video, man. I got to say, it definitely was a great addition to the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, it it was like this. It was so quick too. You know, it's like just happens. I know. I I remember thinking when I saw it, like. That just seems so random. But then, you know, years later, I watched it again. I was like, that just seems so cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's almost like it aged with you guys. At first, you guys were like, eh, but now you're older. You're like, you know what? That right there, that 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 was the one. Yeah, yeah. No, it was. Yeah, I think it was cool, yeah. And also as well, I uh, you guys actually, on October 12th of 2004, you guys actually released my personal favorite album titled Chuck. I was wondering if you can actually just tell our our viewers the story behind this monumental album. And of course, what was it like just putting this this project together in the studio? Because my honest opinion, this was like probably the start of the new Sum 41 sound. I, my honest opinion, it was like a, the first album where it was more mature sound. Yeah, I think I think with does this does this look affected in 2002? Um, we were starting to get heavy, obviously, like it was a little bit more intense, and we were starting to get heavy. But Chuck was like the first album where we went kind of. Um, more like metal with the punk and uh but yeah i that we we went to la to do that at um at at studio city uh no sound city sorry and uh there's been so many great records i mean never mind was recorded there fleetwood mac recorded rumors there uh tom petty did a bunch of stuff there uh so we went there to do it and um again like the first single we're all to blame wasn't a part of those early recording sessions uh we that kind of came later it was the last song that we recorded this the album was basically done then we went off and did a documentary um for the you know in the congo and i remember uh derek had brought his acoustic guitar and he was working on that chorus a little bit and uh that was the only song that really when we came home from the congo and uh, uh that we kind of finished and uh you know different it's weird up until that point i feel like our band every first single we had was kind of a oddball single. Like I think Fat Lip obviously was an odd song if you think about it for its time. Still Waiting, I think came out of left field for a lot of people because it was kind of um, really intense and aggressive where, you know, the last single everyone heard was like In Too Deep and Motivation. And then We're All to Blame is obviously another kind of uh, oddball single for a band like us. So up in that point, our first singles were always like odd singles. Um, but I'm glad we did that because we, I think we were a band that uh, we're not afraid to try something new, even if something was already working. And, uh, you know, it kind of created who we were today. So, yeah, Chuck, uh, Chuck is one of those albums that I look back on. And I think uh, we did good with that one. And I got to say, the one song that I always love, and I got to say, it actually turned out to be my absolute favorite Sum 41 song, which is actually Some Say. I find that song is absolutely beautiful, man. The meaning behind it, even the video, it really gets you thinking as well. Yeah, yeah. The, the video, um, there's, a, there's a movie uh, that Nicole Kidman's in called, um, I think it's called Dogtown or something like that. It's a very, very, uh, it's a hard watch, the movie. I think it's called Dogtown or Dog uh, Dog City or something. But anyway, Nicole Kidman's in it, and it's a long movie, and it's basically it looks like that video. We got the idea for the video, like the look of the video from that movie. Um, but it's a hard watch. Like you know, there's a lot of rape in it, and there's a lot of like weird shit in the movie. But but our director really liked the look of it, and uh, so we kind of copied that movie. And no one really knows the movie. I, I don't think anyone like it didn't really go in the theaters. It was kind of this indie film thing. Um, but yeah, uh, that song, you know, it's funny, that song, I think at the time, I, you know, in high school and in the early 2000s, I was a big Oasis fan. And um, Derek, I, I remember, I don't think he really had touched Oasis yet, but I remember there was a transition between like, does look infected into Chuck in that maybe even a little earlier, but he had, he had asked me to borrow my Oasis records. And now he's obviously, we're all like, I'm a huge Oasis fan. He's a huge Oasis fan. But I think some say was like, you know, it's kind of like that was his 
Oasis-y kind of song. Like that, like that, it really, I think some say it was very heavily influenced by Oasis. And before we move off this, I'll move off the topic of some say, the one thing I've always wondered, because I do know you guys dropped the greatest hits called All, All the Good Shit. I believe it was the uh, year 2001 to 2008. I, I always wondered what, why you guys never included some say in that project. Was, was it, did you guys have a song limit, uh, a song limit of a, of, sorry, of the track list to choose from? Or did you guys just really want to not, not include some say? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't recall uh, the conversation like of picking the songs for that album. I think, yeah, I mean, in hindsight, I think obviously the singles, all the singles should have been included, but yeah, I don't know. I, I don't even remember the conversations and, uh, I know. I think it's a great song too, and we actually started playing it on this last uh, tour we were on this last year. So um, you know, the crowd seems to like it too. Uh, maybe we'll just keep playing it. And also, as well, before we move off the topic of Chuck and whatnot, I also read when you guys were actually out there, uh, you guys actually named the album after a UN peacekeeper that actually helped you guys evacuate uh, a hotel after after a war uh, broke out. I was wondering if you can actually just tell us a bit more about that, about that very, very crazy day. And of course, how did Chuck ultimately get you guys out of the hotel to safety? Yeah. So like I said, like we went to the, we went to the Congo there. I mean, there's a big backstory to this. Like we wanted to get involved with something charity wise. And uh, so we got involved with this um, organization called War Child Canada. And, you know, we, we didn't know what we were going to do. Maybe we'd do a show. Maybe we'd give them. I don't know, a song to sell. They's like, why don't why don't you guys go and do a documentary somewhere? And they they recommended the Congo because there was a lot going on there. There had been a there had been a war in the Congo that was the worst war in African history where three million people had died. And no one in North America, definitely not us, knew that that had happened. Like it wasn't mainstream news like the war in Ukraine right now, you, you see like the war in Ukraine is kind of mainstream news every day. The Congo, 3 million people died. It was never on the news. And we were like, wow, that's crazy that that, that was going on. And, and mostly the war was over the mining. Like they have really, they're really rich in minerals there and specifically a mineral called col coltan, which coltan makes up cell phones and computers. It's a mineral that makes electronics for us. And so that was mind-blowing to us so we went over there and we wanted to like you know people that were fighting in the war over there were as young as like eight years old it was, they were children um you know just given guns and drugged up and told to go you know fight in the forest um it was it was really sad to see so we went over there to like you know uh, basically document the after effects of this civil war that had happened and we were there we were supposed to be there for about 10 days and we were there for about a week and we're sitting in our hotel and we heard some gunshots. Dave thought it was construction, but it was actually gunshots. And uh, so then we got word that this general had tried to cross the border into R Rwanda and was denied access. He came back with a bunch of his, you know, whatever, his army people and started shooting up the border. And then this whole like kind of war started right around. We were staying in this hotel and the border was maybe a kilometer away. And uh, so this war started up and it started heavily the next morning, at like 6 a.m. And Chuck was staying at our hotel. Chuck was, his name's Chuck Peltier, and he was uh, a Canadian, actually a Canadian military uh, guy that had retired. Now he was just over there as a UN peacekeeper. Um, so he, he kind of took us all under his wing. There was about 40 people in the whole, whole hotel. And he put us in the two hotel rooms. And all he had was like this little, almost like a, an umpire padding thing on and a bat and a cigar and you would kind of patrol the hotel and just kind of like walk around the grounds and while we were just all huddled in two hotel rooms well honestly like mortar bombs were exploding around our hotel shaking our hotel um we definitely thought it was close to the end like it was getting really close like the bombs and the shooting and so he had coordinated with the un compound to get these tanks to come grab us all, like everyone from the hotel, all 40 people. So eventually after, um, you know, hours and hours of us just kind of sitting, not knowing what was going to happen, uh, these tanks showed up, we ran to the tanks, took us to the UN compound, slept on the grass for the night on this hill. And uh, eventually we got a, a bus to the airport the next day, but it was just kind of like a city bus and there was still fighting going on. So, you know, they were like, you know, put your bags up in the in the window 
because if stray bullets come through, it'll hit your bag. So, you know, it's still a very tense situation. And we, we had told Chuck back at the hotel, we said, you know, Chuck, if you get us out of this, we're going to name our new album after you. And so when, when the whole thing kind of ended and we all got home and he got home, we named our album Chuck. And uh, that was it. You know, he was he was basically he was he was a hero. And I got to say, he definitely sounds like an absolute badass, like baseball, bat, cigar. Like I, I pictured that in my head and I was like, damn, that's one guy you do not want to mess with. <laughs> if you picture it, that's exactly what he looks like. You know, just walking around with a cigar and a bat and this little hard hat on and just like, I think he had a walkie talkie and he was just, he was just like straight out of the movies and, but serious, a serious hero. And also as well, during the Warp Tour in the early 2000s, you actually met Todd Morse, where you guys actually eventually went on to form the musical duo, the Operation MD. I was wondering if you can actually tell our listeners a bit more about that day you guys met. And of course, what ultimately made you both come come together just, and decide to start this phenomenal duo? Yeah, I don't actually remember the exact time we met, but yeah, I, I, both of our bands were on the whole thing. And, you know, the Warp Tour, as you probably know, runs... And in, in those days, like two and a half months long straight. So we were kind of a new band at the time. We had just, you know, obviously, I think we just had Fat Lip out at the time. We didn't even have In Too Deep out. And so we were kind of the young, new band on the tour. But, you know, people seem, I don't know why, but bands like Pennywise and Rancid and H2O, um, they seem to like us uh, for whatever reason. And Todd would come and hang out all the time. And I think we became, him and I became really good friends over time. And we, we had, we would take H2O. I remember they opened for us a few times in America after that. So we became pretty close and I would go stay at his house in LA and that kind of stuff. And I think we were talking one day, there was, there was like, you know, a, a, I don't remember exactly who was doing um, side projects, but there was seemed to be a lot at the time. And, you know, one band, one side project we actually loved was the transplants. Uh, but there was a whole bunch that we thought were kind of shitty. And so we're like, we should, you know, we were joking, like we should start one and try and make it good. And I think the idea at the time, we, we really wanted to make it kind of like um, very garage rocky kind of uh, not not so much like some 41 or H2O. We want it to be kind of like, you know, dirty garage rock stuff. And so we just started like writing songs, but apart because we I lived in Toronto and he lived in L.A. And we would just send we just email stuff back and forth. And eventually we had enough songs so we just uh shopped it around and aquarius records in canada really liked it and they wanted to sign it and uh and then we you know came out in 2007 and we had another record come out in 2010 um we don't do it as much anymore we did we did just release a kinks uh cover song of all day and all of the night on a kinks tribute album called starstruck that just came out in december so uh, that was kind of like the last thing, like stuff like that pops up, but I don't really foresee us doing a full record anytime soon. Um, but we do like random songs, but it's been fun. I got to say, you guys definitely have some phenomenal chemistry. And it's also really cool to see what you guys have done, because you guys really brought on the doctor personas and kind of gave yourselves like cool nicknames and whatnot, man. I got to say, I definitely love what you guys actually got going on with the Operation MD. Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I think that was the whole the whole purpose of that was to uh just make it different and really not like our other bands because we were already obviously doing that so i don't know how the doctor thing came up <laughs> i think i think the name operation came up and then we were like oh we should maybe dress like doctors then and uh it just kind of it was never a serious band so any any idea just popped up we're like yeah let's do that <laughs> And also as well, on July 18th of 07, uh, Sum 41 actually released the amazing 14-track album titled Under Underclass Hero that was actually the first album after Dave's departure. I was wondering if you can actually tell our listeners a story behind that album. And of course, was a, was a process difficult to record that album with only three members ra rather than the traditional four? Uh, yeah, it was different for sure. Uh, it was a lot of pre-production. I remember that we spent a lot of time in LA, the three of us, just in a little, just a little room in in the valley and uh it was uh, it, it was a long process because it was also the first um time derek was going to produce the, the album and uh, he had never done that before and you know we had a lot of songs and we really there was a lot of long songs like as you know like there's like we really wanted to experiment but not go over the top 
Um, you know, so we had these longer songs and a lot little things like we put more piano, some strings on stuff. We'd never really done that before. We just were, we were really experimenting a lot during that album. And uh, yeah, I, I think it turned out really well. Like, I, I mean, I haven't, actually haven't listened to it in a long time, but you know, the songs that we play off of it, people seem to love like with me for some reason with me has become one of the biggest songs of our set, which was like kind of a late third single. Um, that we released a video for and uh, you know under class hero walking disaster are pretty pretty much staples in our set now so yeah it was a it was a fun album to record i mean unfortunately obviously dave wasn't a part of it um but yeah it, it turned out all right and i gotta say it uh turned off the record and i still listen to it like literally daily man it definitely it definitely gets frequent airplay in my in my vehicle i'll tell you that for a fact awesome that's great. And also, what just when we're on the topic of walking disaster, like how uh, who came up with the idea for have the to have that robot actually walking through the city? Because I got to say that video was so clever. I really, I really thought it was actually a clever idea. Yeah, I, uh, I, I want to say that was kind of the director. Um, we, you know, at that point we were we were, like our, our drummer Steve, who is now our ex drummer, was very very involved in videos. Um, but, you know, I do remember the director had this idea to, for us to play in like a toy store and have like, you know, have this robot kind of. And it's, it's, it's great the way he did it because it almost shows like the robot being sad. He's lonely. He's, you know, he's kind of out and about in the city, but he's like down and out. He's, you know, so he like, you know, seeing that on paper and reading a treatment like that, you're kind of like, OK, but like he, you know, he really pulled it off and made um the robot show emotion somehow you know like when i watched that i'm like wow you can actually feel the emotion of the robot um which was cool yeah no it was it was a fun video to do for sure and also in 2018 i know we're jumping ahead in the timeline a little bit at the reading festival you guys were actually joined on stage by mike shinoda to perform lincoln park's song a Fa a faint i was wondering if you can actually tell our viewers a story actually behind that tribute and of course what actually made some 41 and mike shinoda come together just to perform this phenomenal tribute for chester bennington yeah uh we had we had opened for lincoln park um not not too long before that in amsterdam and, uh, you know, I remember seeing Chester at that show and he, you know, very, you know, it was shocking to me, um, that he, um, passed away and did what he did. You know, it's like, he seemed to me, he seemed like a very happy, uh, guy at that show in Amsterdam and he was looked like full of life and he was very nice to us. And we got a photo, we all got a photo together and he was happy to see us. He was happy that we we're on the show. Um, so when he passed away, you know, and we found out that we were uh, doing the same festival as Mike, um, you know, our, our drummer, Frank Zumo, has some history with those guys, too. We just decided to reach out to him and, um, you know, and he was he was he was into it. Like he was really into it. And, you know, we had we had known those guys for a little while. So, yeah, it was it worked out. And, uh, you know, obviously we all at that point, especially and still missed Miss Chester and wish he was still here. And I heard as well that uh, you that you guys actually didn't get a chance to even rehearse for that day. I heard you you guys were stuck in traffic at the border, and you literally got there 45 minutes before your guys is set. I, I gotta ask, man. Well, with obviously that tribute going on, you have like over like probably over 50,000 people at that festival. Like, were you guys nervous? Because I do know you guys have do this all the time, but were you guys nervous being like, man, like we're doing something we don't usually do every night. We have no way to practice. Uh, you did do your research. <laughs> yeah, we uh, there was like some kind of crazy storm i want to say um so we did we did get there late like and but you know mike came into our dressing room and we quickly ran it like with our acoustic like we have like just guitars back in our dressing room so we ran it with them really fast and then we just run it like you know i think what we were doing was we were kind of we had a recording of it and we we as a band were running it sound check a lot already like at shows so we had kind of the arrangement dialed and we would record it and send it to Mike and be like, this is what we're thinking. This is how we're thinking about doing it. Cause it was different than the record version. Um, so I think he kind of listened to that and kind of learned it. So I think we just uh, went up and wished for the best. <laughs> and I think, I think it happened. Okay. You know, I think it was all right. <laughs> 
and I got to say, I, I I unfortunately couldn't be there to see it live, but I did watch it on BBC, and I I have to say, and I'm not just saying this because we got the bass player of Sum 41 on my radio station, but I found Derek did such a phenomenal job singing Chester's parts. I mean, like when I heard that, it absolutely freaking blew me away. I was like, Jesus, man, like what what can't Derek do, honestly? Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I I I I think you're right. Like I think he really killed it, and um, I haven't really heard too many people do Lincoln Park before, but I, when I heard Derek sing that chorus, I was like, that is not far off of Chester. I mean, that is, it's like, that is on, on point. And so, no, I think he, uh, he definitely killed it for sure. Cause he, when it comes to Chester, like he could actually have such a soft spoken, like vocals. And then next thing, you know, just scream like a snap a second later. I know Derek can do that in his music as well with, with some 41, but just being able to hear someone like Derek do Chester Bennington so well. And I like just sitting on my own couch, I was like, Jesus, man, like I could only imagine how the, how the fans felt being there with the shivers going down their spines in that exact moment. Yeah. And you know, like I was talking about that Amsterdam show that we opened for them not too long before that. Watching Chester sing live, um, like it, it really blows you away. And it, it, like some of the songs he was singing, and he'd say he'd do some acapella stuff. And his he like you said, he can go from like this soft sing to a scream, and the scream is so powerful and on key, and like just and it gets under your skin. It gives you goosebumps. And uh, he was a real talent. And um, no, but like I said, like Derek did pull it off really well. And also, as well, aside from being a legendary bass player, you actually are on the radio as well, where you actually have your own radio show called Cone's Cave on 94.9 The Rock out there in Toronto. I was wondering if you can actually tell us a bit more about your radio show. And of course, what ultimately made you decide to venture into the radio community? I had this I had this idea in the mid 2000s and uh, there was a uh, now uh, a late radio host called Dave Bookman. Everyone knew him as Bookie was now not with us anymore, unfortunately. Um, but he, he used to bring me on his show. He was, he was on this station called one, uh, 102.1 the edge. And so he'd bring me on every once in a while and do interviews on the air. And he, he'd always like say, Oh, that was really great. Like you should come on my show like every week and maybe do like cones corner or something like that. Like kind of like, you know, the old NHL coaches corner. I was like, Oh yeah, yeah, let's do that. And you know, it was always like this. Oh yeah, yeah. Let's try and do that. And we were, we were just so busy in the mid two thousands. And also, also I was like so young and I was uh, probably not, it was when, wasn't the right time for me to do something like that. So then time went on and, you know, Bookie passed away and then the pandemic hit and uh, I had some time and I started thinking like, I really, you know, that, that, that would be really fun. And I, I love, like all my friends know this, like I love at a party, like I'll be the DJ. And in our dressing room when we're warming up before show, I'm the DJ. Like I play songs all the time. I love showing people songs. I love playing songs. So that was kind of the thing. I was just like, you know, I have some time during the pandemic. I'm going to get this radio show up and going. And I didn't have a home for it. Um, but 94.9 The Rock is located in Oshawa. And we grew up in Ajax, which is like 15 minutes down the road. So it just seemed like a really good home. Uh, you know, it's really close to where we grew up. And they gave me the freedom. They said, you, we'll give you an hour. You can play whatever you want. You can do whatever the hell you want. We won't say a word. You can play whatever. I was like... I like that. And so, you know, and I, one big thing was like, I, you know, I know a lot of people like I've, we've been touring for over 20 years. So I know a lot of musicians, we've toured with a lot of musicians. So I was like, you know, I should have some guests on and I've had some great guests and uh, you know, it's every Sunday night at 7 PM and uh, 94, nine, the rock in Toronto. But the other great thing I liked about it was it wasn't just a Toronto thing. You could stream it from anywhere in the world. Like, so I got people in Australia listening to it, Europe, Asia, um, South America, so you can stream it at the rock.fm. Uh, so that was a big plus for me, you know. Uh, but the only thing, the only thing that we haven't figured out yet is if you miss the show, you can't hear the show. <laughs> so, you know, it's like a one and done type thing. It's not like a podcast. It's like you either either catch the seven o'clock show or it's gone. And also as well, because I do know I saw in your Instagram story, I think it was a few days ago, you actually got back in your recording new episodes. Since we're just on the topic of this, what are some of the up and coming guests you actually got coming up on your show? Um, well, when's this? Is, oh, this is live. Yeah, I mean, I got some great guests. I have um, next week will be Glenn Matlock from the Sex Pistols, who was the original Sex Pistols bass player before Sid Vicious and who wrote, co-wrote a lot of the songs that are on Nevermind the Books. 
So that was a big one for me. Um, I got Max from Arkells. I got uh, Pete from the Bouncing Souls coming up. Um, I got Danko Jones coming up. Uh, and I'm, I'm constantly doing interviews. Uh, and, you know, I got some I've I got some big ones in the works that aren't confirmed, so I, I couldn't really say. But those are a couple guests that I have coming up. Um, but this week will be – this Sunday will be the part two of the best of where I'm just – I'm playing guests from last year. And uh, next week I'll start with my uh, guests again. And also I've, I've heard many reports actually throughout the music industry that Sum 41 is currently working on a double album, which is going to be half punk, half metal. I was wondering from what you are allowed to speak about, because obviously, you know, the album isn't out yet uh, for what you actually are allowed to talk about and reveal. Can you tell us a bit more about what us fans can actually expect from this up and coming Sum 41 project? Yeah, this was kind of a pandemic kind of record too. It's, you know, I, I remember just kind of sitting home and it's been, I don't know, a year over the pandemic and i got a call from derek he's like uh i got i got a bunch of songs you know i have a, I have a bunch of ideas and i'm going to send them to you and start putting some bass ideas down on on them and we'll start talking about the record and he sent me a bunch of them and they were like drastically different from one another like you know i'm talking like a song sounded like something from all killer and then another song sounded like slayer <laughs> and i was like so <laughs> but there was a lot of them too like there was uh, I don't know. I think we ended up recording 18 or 20 songs in the end. Um, so when we had this whole, when we, we, we didn't have a plan, we just said, let's just record them all. And that's it. You know, we'll just, just record them. We have time. And by the end of it, we started chatting over text or email. And, um, the idea came, I was like, what about a double album? And we're like, yeah, do people, do people do that anymore? <laughs> like, is it, you know, like with the, the age of streaming, like, we're like, we all got really excited about it. And the, the fact that one, there was a bunch of songs that were very like almost pop punk, old Sum 41 early days. And then the other a bunch of them that were really like metal, thrash metal, heavy. Um, so we're like, you know, let's maybe do that one side and one side like that. And we'll call it heaven and hell. And uh, that's the idea as, as of now. <laughs> I don't, and we don't have a release date. We don't even have a record label. Uh, so we're just in the the late stages of kind of like finishing it up. I think Derek has some songs. He's still got to sing, still have to mix it, still have to master it. And then we got to find someone to put it out. And also, I know a lot of the fans are probably wondering the same thing. And I got to say, obviously, this album isn't done yet. So if you want to skip this question, I completely understand. Obviously, the the, uh, the punk uh, side of, uh, so I'm guessing the heaven side would be the punk side. Um, if you can compare it to any one of your guys' last projects sound wise, like which one would you kind of like, you know, put it in the same category with kind of give the fans an idea of what, of what they can really expect from the heaven side. Yeah. I think it's not so much like all killers much. Um, maybe like a cross between all killer and underclass hero. Um, you know, the, the songs are, you know, wouldn't be as long as like say a walk in disaster. Um, but probably, you know, yeah, somewhere somewhere in that pop punk zone, underclass hero meets all killer. I gotta say, I'm definitely liking what I'm hearing. <laughs> I gotta say, I'm definitely enjoying what I hear there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But also as well, I do know that you guys actually just released some more tour tour dates as well. I was wondering if you can actually tell us a bit more about this up and coming tour. And of course, do you actually have any any plans to actually do any more U.S. or Canadian dates throughout the year? Because I do know you got Japan, you got Germany as well. So you guys are going to be pinging all, all, all over, uh, sorry, overseas. Yeah, yeah. It's um, we, had, we had talked about Canada a lot this past year. And for whatever reason, there wasn't, you know, we're really into um, like doing these like packages, things like we did with Simple Plan last year. And uh, we we're looking at some bands for Canada and like, for whatever reason, our schedules with the bands we were looking at didn't really line up. So we said, you know, let's maybe save Canada till maybe the new record comes out and who we want to go across Canada with our schedules can line up because there's no point just going across with and, and making it just, just going across just to do it. You know, we might as well make it good and big and um, have, you know, another band on that we really like and will mean something and uh, to fans and whatever. So, yeah, we're, we're doing two weeks in Asia in March and then three weeks in June in Europe. And I don't know what we're doing after that. <laughs> there's no there's no plan for anything. I think I think the idea after that is probably just to see where we're at with the new album, when we're going to release it, 
hopefully release a single at some point and and then we'll kind of like start to map out everything after that and kind of do the whole world again once we have the new album I gotta say that definitely sounds great. I actually had a chance to see you guys at Blues Fest. Uh, actually, I think it was this past summer that has passed. But yeah. I got called into work and I had tickets. And instead of me being, oh, you know, they're always around. I'll always go to work. I literally should have called in sick. I should have been <laughs> like, sorry, I'm sick, can't go. <laughs> yeah, literally, we're never around here. <laughs> so. Yeah. I, I I was saying to myself, you know what? I'm feeling lucky. I I, I think they're gonna be back soon. Yeah, no. <laughs> so it, it is what it is you know what i mean should have called in sick but what what can you do right well we'll be back i you know canada's definitely like we know we we know we we're, we're gonna do it we know we know we have to do it we know we want to do it and we're just now finding you know like i said like that other band that we want to do it with and what time we want to do it in the year and also, I, I got to ask, well, what is next for yourself, Cone? Because obviously, you know, you've got this uh, radio show you're doing. you got tour coming up, this new record we just spoke about. Is there anything we happen to miss during this interview? Anything else you do still want to touch on, talk about? We still got you here live on 99.9 Punk World Radio FM. Uh, you know, that's about it. Like, you know, the radio show is kind of like my weekly thing that I do. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to going to Asia in March with Sum 41. I am producing some stuff again, which I, I did done through my career i'm uh next week i'm starting with um uh, a singer named coster and so i've already done three songs with him and i'm gonna do two more next week and then i'm gonna do another song with this other toronto band called Le barons which is kind of like an alt country type band and he's also a, a tattoo artist and and a very great author named chris and the band's great so i i think that's going to carry me through for the next months is coster and Le barons producing and the radio show and then some 41 in March and some 41 in June. And uh, I don't know what I'm doing after that. <laughs> <laughs> I got, and I, uh, before we part ways there, Cone, I just got to say uh, for the people that don't actually have, you know, Cone on Instagram or Facebook, how can they follow you and stay updated on everything, you know, uh, Cone's Cave and of course, some 41 and yourself? Yeah. I mean, Instagram's just official Cone McCaslin and, uh, and then I have a website called comacaslin.com and actually people can message, message me through both. And I, I'm, I'm one of those people that actually, you know, responds to messages. I think you messaged me through that. I did. Yep. I was actually super surprised. I, I literally, when I, when you came back and said, yes, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, it's not, some people respond, some people don't like, I, I know, like, that's how I got a hold of Glenn Matlock from sex pistols. I was, I just messaged them on Instagram. I was like, Hey, I got this radio show. I'm, I, I play in some 41 and you want to come on I'm a bass player too. And he was like, like within like an hour, he was like, yeah, I'll do it. So, you know, some people do, I, I do respond, you know, sometimes it takes me a little while, but um, I do respond quite a bit and uh, that's about it. I, you know, I obviously have Twitter, but I don't really use it as much. Instagram's kind of my thing. And um, yeah. And I got to say, first and foremost, Cone, thank you so much for just giving us a bit of your time here this evening, talking about Sum 41's history, what you guys got coming up, this tour, this radio show. Um, I got to say, first and foremost, thank you so much for getting back to me. Um, if it wasn't for Sum 41, there would really be no DJ Immortal. I wouldn't be here today because your guys' music really saved my life. So for that, thank you for everything you've done for music and all the fans worldwide. Oh, amazing. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for reaching out. Hey, you're most certainly welcome, Cone. Definitely have yourself a phenomenal night. And of course, safe travels on tour as well. Thank you very much. Most definitely. Thank you so much again, Cone. Okay, thanks.